midst of a transportation revolution. Every aspect of our transportation is being literally reinvented as we speak, from what we drive to how we get from point A to point B, to what mass transit even looks like, how long it takes to get anywhere, and who's in control of those modes of transportation and who powers them. It's all being reinvented. Electric vehicles, but goes way beyond electric vehicles. I would say it's been evolving for at least 15 years or so, and our guest today will will probably <laughs> correct me. But it's greatly accelerating now because the government has now provided billions, literally, of dollars in funding and incentives to accelerate the transition. Transportation is the single largest source of our carbon emissions, so we have to tackle this beast. What does this new transportation system look like and how is it evolving? Today we're going to find out from the woman who literally sits at the top of the heap in this industry, the U.S. Deputy Secretary of Transportation. So buckle up and grab your notebook or tablet and to take notes. Welcome to Electric Ladies Podcast. We share stories, insights, tips, and advice from remarkably innovative women working on the front lines of corporate responsibility, energy, sustainability, and ESG-related issues. I'm your host, Joan Michelson. We talk about innovation, leadership, technologies, and careers, always bringing a new perspective. Find us anywhere you like to listen to podcasts on our website, electricladiespodcast.com, and through my Forbes articles as well. And please pass it on to your friends, and feel free to leave us a five-star review. It helps people find us, and we like the, 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 the juice. Um, if you're struggling with your own career, please reach out to me on Twitter and let me know. There's a lot of opportunities we'll talk about today. We can help you no matter what industry you're in. So as I said, transportation is the single largest source of greenhouse gas. It's actually 29% is the last statistic I saw from the EPA. And so we're really reinventing transportation around the globe. It's the, but we're doing it while we use it. So we're, it's the proverbial fueling the plane while we're flying it. It's, it's pretty insane. But how do we do it? And how do we get the public on board? How do we allocate limited resources? The federal government is now investing literally billions of dollars in reinventing um, and upgrading our infrastructure. But how do you decide where to invest? Let's find out. I'd like you to meet the U.S. Deputy Secretary of Transportation, Polly Trottenberg. She's also functioning as the Chief Operating Officer, if you will, of the Department of Transportation, helping Secretary Pete Buttigieg provide leadership, strategic vision, and management of the DOT, U.S. DOT. As such, she's a major player in the agency's implementation of the Inflation Investment and Jobs Act, which I mentioned a minute ago, and transportation elements of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, as well as the normal portfolio, which we'll get into as well. Before joining the Biden administration, Secretary Trottenberg was Transportation Commissioner of New York City for seven years. And anybody who's a listener of Electric Ladies Podcast knows that I am a native New York City girl. So I can only imagine what it was like shepherding these crazy New Yorkers, thousands of New Yorkers, um, in transpor transportation, especially through COVID, my goodness. She was also Assistant Secretary and Undersecretary for Policy in the Obama administration, worked on the Hill. I could go on for three days, but I won't. She earned her undergraduate degree from Barnard College and her Master's in Public Policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. And I am thrilled to say we are here live in the DOT office with Secretary Trottenberg. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks, Joan, for, for this opportunity. It's great to talk to you. Um, and I, I love your setup, uh, talking about the revolution that's happening in transportation, because I have got to experience it, uh, as you've mentioned, from several perches, but particularly having the experience of being in the Obama administration, now in the Biden administration, and having spent time as a local transportation official, obviously in a big locality, New York City. And you are right that some of these trends have been growing for some years. I mean, particularly generationally, right? We are a country that has started to move away from the notion that what, you ha what happens to you when you're a teenager, you get your driver's license and your main mode of transportation is gonna be a car. Now that's never been the case in New York City, but in a lot of the rest of the country, that's been the case. For newer generations, they've been much more inclined to see transportation as something that's on their phone. Yeah. That is a menu of options. 
could be a car, could be car share, could be Uber, could be bike share, could be mass transit. I think uh, the smartphone has done a lot to start that revolution um, in some really profound ways. And in New York City, got to see, I think, some of the good and the bad sometimes of that revolution. Um, you know, working with private sector partners, uh, you have to carefully manage sometimes how mm -hmm. some of that, you know, some of that sort of public-private infrastructure gets integrated into a public system. You are also right that COVID um, mm -hmm. has had a real profound effect on our transportation system. And I did get to see that on the front lines in New York City. To go from a bustling, congested city with a subway system that was bursting at the seams to one in which for a time the streets were empty. I know, that was so unbelievable. As a New Yorker, to look at pictures of Times Square empty. Unbelievable. And, and a subway system. And a subway system. Empty. And at that time, uh, as transportation commissioner, I ran the Staten Island Ferry. Oh, my God. And to watch the ferry, which was a bustling 24-hour-a-day operation, to see that ridership plummet. Um, and just to see the effect that that took on the economy, on the workforce, on their health and safety, and to decide as we started to come out of COVID, how do we reconstitute? It had a huge effect on the aviation industry. Um, and look. Parts of the transportation system have bounced back. Aviation actually is now roaring back. Um, mass transit, not as much. Mm -hmm. Roadways now, you know, as busy as they ever were, and tragically, you know, the spike in fatalities that mm -hmm. we saw during COVID is still with us, something we're making a big priority at the Department of Transportation. Another thing that has become more revolutionary, and this is a reason I'm so proud to be in the Biden administration, as you mentioned, the focus on climate change. That is definitely a generational change in how we view transportation. As you say, transportation is the largest contributor of greenhouse gases, and therefore something our secretary often says, also potentially the largest solution. Exactly. And it has been, I think, the experience of a lifetime, a once in a generation opportunity with the bipartisan infrastructure law, or EJA, it goes by different names. But to literally, you said billions, hundreds and hundreds of billions yeah. of dollars to invest in building up uh, electric vehicle charging network and giving cities and states dollars to spend on mass transit, on decarbonizing different parts of their system, on fostering more walking and biking, on passenger rail, on things that we have talked about a lot in American transportation policy and done some amount of investment and policy focus on, but with this administration, it has been pretty revolutionary and very exciting, challenging, you know, certainly we, we'll, we'll talk a bit about some of the EV charging work that I know you've been following. You know, certainly you can have your ups and downs, but in general, you are right. This is a revolutionary period in, in American transportation. Yeah, totally. It's, it's um, well, there's a lot to unpack in there and, and you touched on several things I wanna explore further, but I wanna go back for a second because I don't think that people really understand all that fits into the portfolio of the Department of Transportation. Most times people, when you say the Department of Transportation, they think cars. And your portfolio is way beyond cars. I mean, it's, you know, the proverbial uh, planes, trains, and automobiles, right? But give us a sort of the Cliff Notes version, a brief description of what all falls under the portfolio of the Department of Transportation? Yeah, and it's a great question. And I actually, to, I think to answer that question, I want to pull the lens back even a little further uh, because the transportation system in the U.S. is a very decentralized system. Um, you know, we are a decentralized country in our governance, in our geography, in sort of our public-private economy. So the Department of Transportation sort of has a different level of oversight and management of different parts of the system. I'll start with the part of the system that we oversee and manage most directly, which is the aviation system. Hmm. We operate the air traffic control system of the United States and, you know, by extension connected to the rest of the globe. It is the largest 24-7 safety critical operation in the federal government. And it's one of those systems where you don't think about it unless it's yeah, you expect it to work, and that. if you think about the size and complexity, on any given day, there are thousands of flights in the air, there are hundreds of thousands of people in the air, they are flying to airports all over the country, that has to be coordinate. Could be weather, could be military operations, all kinds of things happening on any given day. It's an extraordinary system. 
We're also responsibility basically for overseeing the safety regulation of the aviation system. And you've seen, you know, lately we've had some incidents yeah. happening with Boeing. So enormous departmental responsibilities there. And I think people don't always appreciate the breadth and the complexity and the expertise and the resources needed to run that system. You, you mentioned- So I just want to yeah. point out to people that you were actually acting uh, administrator of the FAA yes. for a period of time until fairly recently. So this is a woman who knows from what she speaks. Yes, so you've no, actually I, been I, at the desk making those decisions. I had the extraordinary opportunity to do that. And it's something, it's funny, that there's never been a deputy secretary who, who got to do that. And I like to joke now that every deputy secretary should because it is such a big and important part of the agency, but the work is very specialized. And, you know, trying to make sure that it's integrated with everything else that we're doing, I think, is an ongoing priority and opportunity. You mentioned people think about cars, and, you know, it is true. Probably the next biggest part of our agency is the Federal Highway Administration, which, along with some of the other parts of our agency, Federal Transit Administration, Federal Railroad Administration, does a lot of grant making. They are the folks who are out there, you know, basically providing resources for regular roads and bridges, kind of the bread and butter work. But now, particularly with the bipartisan infrastructure law, all kinds of discretionary grant programs where we are fostering, I think, some of those experiments and some of that really revolutionary work and really particularly trying to empower states and localities to bring us their best ideas. It does not, again, it's a decentralized system. It doesn't all flow from Washington. You know, we want a lot of it to flow up from different parts of the country. Their needs, their priorities, you know, their their best ideas. Yeah, they they have their own pulse on their communities. They know what their community needs. It's almost like there's different it's almost like the US is I've lived in eight states. And it feels like there's a whole bunch of countries within this country. We we are huge and, and very diverse. <laughs> We are, in addition to a big grant-making agency, we are a pretty big regulatory agency, particularly each of our modes actually does regulation, but particularly some of the more famous ones you would have heard of, NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, really focused on roadway safety. We are also a maritime agency. We have our maritime administration, and something a little known, you're a New Yorker, I'll see if you know this, we run the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. You um, do? Yes, wow. on Long Island, where we are training the next generation of mariners, some of whom, by the way, are at sea right now, over in the Gulf region, wow. frankly, bringing the supplies and, and helping to keep that region and that economy afloat, so doing really important wow, work. Wow, yeah, and in harm's way, yeah, 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 wow. Well, thank you for that, because I think, of the, of course, there's rail, and you know, we're, you're sitting in front of a photo people can't yeah. necessarily see unless they're on video of a, of a train going by. Um, one thing I don't know if I ever told you, but is um, I actually uh, had a marketing leadership role in the rollout of the LA mass transit system. And that was in part deciding where the train stations should go as they rolled out and working with uh, area developers to help expand that and get people involved, get people to use the trains, get people to use the system. And you talked about getting people back into mass transit, which is part of why I mention it. So I wanted to ask you, how do you, how do you decide what the, what the, how do you know what the public wants? I mean, you talked about the communities doing their work and I've interviewed like, uh, the Deputy Secretary of the North Carolina Transportation Department and, and a few other folks in those roles. But how do you, from the, the country, the, the federal government DOT side, how do you determine what the public wants from transportation and also kind of what they're gonna, what they need and what they're gonna need? Yeah. You know, it's like I remember the, the historic, the story of when Steve Ballmer was gonna join Bill Gates to form Microsoft, his mother said, well, that's great, Steve, but who would want to use a computer? Right, so there's always the anticipate, you know, the, the breakthrough technology that people aren't, we don't, maybe don't know they need yet. And as, and the investments in transportation have a very long life cycle, both mm -hmm. they laugh, they, they, they're very expensive, they take a long time to develop, you're investing for the next 30 years, really, or you're 50 sometimes years. Sometimes investing for the next 100 years. Yeah, well, there you go, I rest my case. So how do you decide that? It's an excellent question, and I, I think I'm gonna say it's a little bit of all of the above. I mean, as I have said, and one thing, again, I think we're very proud of in this administration, we have put a big focus on 
community engagement, on making sure that we are bringing, you know, particularly underrepresented communities, communities of color, tribal communities, low income communities, that frankly have not always had the seat at the table that they should as we've planned transportation projects. And frankly, in some cases, not only didn't have the seat at the table, but basically were on the menu. Yeah, right. And saw their communities divided and also didn't even get out of it the jobs and economic opportunities that building this kind of if infrastructure. If anything, they got the emissions. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, we are very focused on bringing in local voices and making sure that they are part of the discussion. But it is also true in transportation, you need to have a vision. You need to have a vision at the local level, the state level, and the national level. Um, you know, when I was in New York, a couple things that we had vision on, Vision Zero. You know, mayor, my mayor made a commitment early on that we were going to try and reduce roadway fatalities. We're now trying to do that at the national level as well. And that means you are pushing projects and policies to try and save lives. And look, sometimes those policies are met with great excitement. But sometimes, you know, yes, you, you have to do the work and it can be a challenge. But I think you need to bring, you know, again, for this administration, tackling climate change, a huge priority. And, you know, we are very lucky. We have, you know, a number of programs that are enabling us to do that. We are obviously trying to encourage jurisdictions around the country to work with us on that. But they are bringing us fantastic ideas, too. As I say, oh, cool. it doesn't all flow from Washington. Um, there is so much creativity going on at the state and local level right now. Um, you know, that's part of the fun of this job, seeing, you know, you think, oh, New York City, this big city with all these great ideas, but you can go to really modest small communities where they're doing some really cool things, and there's a real lot of vision and excitement on the ground. Yeah, the, the heartland, as it's affectionately referred to, has a lot of talent that most people don't realize. I lived in extreme hot and extreme cold. I lived in Las Vegas, and I lived in Fargo, North Dakota. and. Wow. There's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I did a 170 degree swing in 18 months. It was kind of a trip. But there's, you know, these are places, I mean, obviously Las Vegas has the Super Bowl this weekend and, you know, has its own um, reputation. But even places, the, the actual core community of Las Vegas has a lot more tech talent and, and innovative talent that has nothing to do with the strip and gambling. And even Fargo has, I mean, it's the largest, second largest employment base for Microsoft in the country. So, and they have their own needs. I mean, you have to be able to have a transportation system. You have to have a transportation system that can be in 120 degree weather and functioning in roads and in 40 below. So it, they're not going to be the same. Right? Well, and, I, and I'll give you a great example because I've, you know, had a, had a chance to sort of be on the ground firsthand with a few of the projects in and around Vegas big focus on things like bus rapid transit to help the workforce get in to serve the strip and all the you know the casinos and hotels um, as you get further into sort of the more you know kind of residential parts of Vegas roadways that are astonishingly unsafe and a lot of work done there to start redesigning them to create sidewalks and bike lanes and pedestrian refuge islands to, to make them safe and comfortable for people to walk and bike on Big exciting project we've just announced, Brightline West. High speed rail between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. A really, really exciting project. Spent some time in North Dakota too, actually, and there, not surprisingly, big focus on freight movements. Yeah, absolutely. You know, maybe worrying less about getting all the people around and more on making sure agricultural products and other things that they can get them where they need to go for their, oh, yeah, you know, for their economics. It's success. a huge agricultural center. Yeah, but you can't get from one end of the state to the other without driving still. That's another topic. Um, you mentioned electric vehicles, and as anybody who listens to Electric Ladies knows or, or saw my bio, I worked at Chrysler. I have a particular affection for electric vehicles. I headed up communications and co-headed sales and marketing for the electric car division of Chrysler. And we did, we did a um, hockey stick growth by, by in part tapping into government opportunities to, that we could leverage at the time. So talk about the, the, and there's obviously many, many billions of dollars going into not just incentives for people to buy electric vehicles, but also to build the infrastructure writ large. I mean, you can't, it's a chicken and the egg thing. You really need both simultaneously. And there's, um, they're, they're expanding to where, how can I say this? They're expanding to, people don't always know where they need it, and you might not know where they're needed. So how are you determining, I think the, the Biden administration has a goal of 500,000 chargers through the infrastructure bill, 
for example, or maybe through the Inflation Reduction Act and the two together. But how are you deciding where to put those and how to allocate those funds? Because everybody's going to say, we need the most or we need, you know, how do you, how do you divvy that up? It's a great question, and Congress has, has helped us there because they created this uh, this um, seven and a half billion dollar EV charging program. So so I'll just particularly focus on the infrastructure piece of it. And it, Joan, it's a little bit of what we're talking about here, which is a little bit of policy to guide some of what we need to do, but then also a lot of state and local input. So one one decision again made by this administration, but also guided by Congress, is to try and basically fill in market gaps. And I think one of the things we recognize pretty quickly is you want to have, you know, level three high capacity charging available along the major highway network of the country. And as you know, you're an expert in this, you know, level three charging, it's a major investment, you yeah. know, the power, the infrastructure. And so the, the first part of the program, $5 million, what we call the NEVI part of the program, we decided to dedicate to building out that national highway network. Now, we did it in consultation with the states who created their own plan, so they gave us their priorities. We encouraged particularly that they try and have charging every 50 miles. We made some exceptions in, in certain rural parts of the country where that wasn't going to work, but generally that sort of became a pretty kind of logical way of figuring out how to build out that network. But the states brought us their ideas about where they wanted to site these chargers. We also particularly agreed to focus on making sure, again, that local voices were heard as the states were designing their plans. And I think the states in general came up with a great set of plans. They've got formula dollars now, and as you've seen, some of those chargers are starting to hit the street. The first one is in Ohio. Other states are, are now following suit. Second part of that program is discretionary dollars where we're being much more of the school of states, localities, come tell us where you think the charges should hmm. go, what your needs are, and that varies a lot. New Mexico wants to invest in a charging network along some of its key corridors to eventually have electric trucks. For some cities, they're looking much more like how could we you know, have on-street charging for residents, maybe even have charging that's also for electric bikes, for for scooters, you know, again, not a one size fits all and very much tailored to what locals are telling us that we need. One thing that, that we have talked about is a couple of, again, places where we saw perhaps a good need to intervene, quick dollars out the door to go and fix existing chargers yeah. that either they were first generation and frankly the, the technology sort of worn out or just they've been neglected. And that we sort of saw that as some good low-hanging fruit to get a bunch of chargers that don't need a new power source um, quickly up and functional again. So again, it, it's I think it's a mixture of some good policy directives, but obviously a lot of local input too about where the needs are. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because it's become a big reason why a lot of people are resisting uh, electric vehicles. And I've talked to some amazing innovators in this stuff. I mean, I talked to one woman who started a company that uses, in effect, and, and we might have talked about this when we were at the DC Auto Show, um, using essentially parking meters to charge as a charger for an electric vehicle, except that the power comes from the home, the property it's in front of, and the revenue goes that way, so that it doesn't have to go through the whole bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, I mean, so these ideas are just unbelievable. I the, can't imagine how you decide how to pick through them. No, all. There, there are a ton of creative ideas, right? At the time that I was commissioner in New York, we were figuring out how to potentially, you know, just tap into light poles, you know, already yeah. existing yeah. power light, sources. Yes, so definitely. I think there's a lot of great experimentation. And look, like any experimentation, there'll be some hit and miss. But I think, you know, you mentioned that revolution. I mean, the entrepreneurial spirit that we have seen, the companies that are out there doing so many creative things. It's been a lot of fun and very inspirational. So one of the, um, I want to touch a little bit, first of all, on, on something that you said a minute ago, and that uh, is how do you, um, there's, today's, part of this revolution is people are using various forms of transportation in a particular journey. So obviously, I mean, I grew up in New York City, so I grew up with public transportation, right? So I'm, I'm akin to the subway, um, although I haven't used it as much since COVID, I confess. But 
there's there's people using the subway to get to the airport, you know, from the airport to the subway. There's people using the buses to get to yada yada. There's people taking the bus to, you know, they're taking the bus to pick up a zip car to do, you know, to pick up a ride. I mean, there's people. So how do you, what's the best way to coordinate that to help drive usage? Because the more we can get people out of single occupancy vehicles, she says, as a person who drives one, frankly. But the more we can get people out of just using their own car all the time, how, is, the, is to help them figure out how to use a multimodal system. So talk about how those, how the pieces of the transportation system coordinate and where that fits into your this vision thing. Yeah, I'll, and I'll give you two answers on that, sort of a big picture governance answer and then a, I think a technology answer. Um, I'll start with the technology answer. I mean, as I said before, the advent of the smartphone, and by the way, the GPS mm. system that it uses, which I always like to note, created by the federal government, and it powers so much of the innovation that's happened in the transportation space. You know, now I have to say, I, I'm, I'm fond of City Mapper when you talk about apps where it does exactly what you're talking about. You tell it where you want to go, and it'll tell you the 14 ways you can get there, including showing you where you can find a scooter, a bike share, hailing an Uber, what subway, what bus, what ferry. I mean, I think those technologies are really fantastic now. And part of what's making it revolutionary, before, if you were in a strange city, you didn't know how to, you were going to catch the bus or grab the ferry or any of these things. I think that GPS technology, um, you know, and now that so many transit systems are providing that open source data, I mean, that's the other thing. Now, if I want to leave this, this office and hop on the hop on the metro, I can look at my phone and see the next train's coming in 10 minutes. It takes me seven minutes to get down there. Uh, okay, I got a minute or two. Um, so I do think that technology is it's profound and revolutionary. It's generational too. Obviously, younger generation is very fluent in it. I think though, there is another thing, and I certainly grappled with this in New York, and, and you can appreciate that. I was the transportation commissioner. I ran parts of the transportation system. But there was also the MTA, yeah. there was the Port Authority, there was New York State DOT, they were private providers. And you know, one thing that we would always say is, the traveler doesn't care. They just want to get where they're going. They want it to be a seamless system. And you know, just as I mentioned that we're a decentralized country, just one thing in our transportation system, it can often be very complex, have a lot of different agencies, a complicated governance structure. Um, it's something as we're tackling big projects like the Gateway Project in New York. We think a lot about governance and how to make sure if there are a lot of different parties and players that they're coming together uh, and that you know they're working as a team and that what we're going to be providing to the public is hopefully going to be convenient and seamless. And who is responsible for what if the proverbial hits the fan? Yeah. You know, you don't want somebody to go, well, it's them and it's, you know, and everybody's pointing at everybody else. Um, which, you know, Kind of goes to my next question, and then I want to uh, ask you something else and get to some career advice, which I know we both care about. Um, the public isn't seeing a lot of this. They don't. The public doesn't necessarily get it. We the public sees when there's construction that's making their commute long, or they know when the flights are delayed, or you know the Boeing catastrophes, or the. Um, uh, whatever, the, the Red Sea problem with the ships that can't go through. They, they hear the problems, but they don't hear when things are working. They don't hear the, they might see the cranes of construction, and they might see the work crews on the street. Hopefully some of them are on the work crews. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So how can the public see, it's, their, it's our tax dollars at work, and so people are trying to, people are saying, well, you know, they put all this money and I don't see it. Well, they, they, they probably do, but it's not registering as that. So how can we help people not just focus on the problem, but see when the solution is being born? Because it takes time and it takes yeah. money, and it's going to ultimately change their lives. But it, you know, they, it happens in, in increments. It's a great question. And look, one thing, it, it, it's an honor to work for, you know, Pete Buttigieg, a secretary, who is a wonderful communicator. Oh, he's a master. Yeah. And I think he has done a really great job of helping people sort of see the vision of, you know, he's been all over the country and 
it matters when you show up and you're breaking ground and you are standing with the workers who are going to get those jobs and maybe the firm that's going to get those contracts. It is true, infrastructure projects take a while, but one thing he has also declared for us in, in year four of the Biden administration, this is the year of project delivery. So we are going to be working hard to really get those projects visible, get some of them done, get them underway, and, and hopefully show the public uh, that this administration really is going to produce you know, the kind of transportation projects that are going to improve their lives, that are going to improve their communities, that are going to strengthen the economy. Um, and look, I think we are seeing some of the economic benefits of these investments already. Obviously, proud to be in an administration where we are seeing really good economic news. Very low unemployment, a lot of job creation, a lot of good news coming. And, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll help, you know, share that, that good news with the public and with our secretary and other members of the administration. You know, we'll be out and about and, and on the ground showing people the work we're doing. So to that point, there are people, there's a huge amount, number of opportunities. I mean, there's, there's, you know, even small businesses, any kind of business that can seize the opportunities in this funding to do some do some upgrade that they've always wanted to do. I mean, if you're a manufacturing company and you've been complaining about, you know, your your manufacturing processes going down a lot or whatever, if you, my understanding is if you can revise it or upgrade it in a way that also reduces your carbon footprint, then you can take advantage of some of these benefits. If you're a construction company that you know, works on roadways and you can find a way to you know get one of these contracts that helps your business right so there's an opportunity to use this upgrade also as an economic opportunity how can people find or if you're in a you know policy making position mm -hmm. in some of these other states and locales so how can people find the the things we're talking about how can people find the grants and the funding opportunities so that they can say, well, let me see where my business fits in, or let me see where my, what my community can benefit from, and the obverse, what's already being done in my community. Yeah. So how can people find out about this more? Is there an easy way for them yeah, to find well, it? Yeah, and, well, and let me make a couple points on what you're saying, because I think in this administration, another one of our big focuses has really been the revitalization of manufacturing in the United States. Mm -hmm. And the president and this administration are strong supporters of the concept of Buy America which is that federal dollar should really be invested in making products in this country and employing American workers, mm -hmm. um, preferably union workers. So we have that very strong policy, and I think that is already, you are seeing, spurring you know, a growth in manufacturing around the country. We have a bunch of different programs in which sort of decarbonizing manufacturing processes can be eligible. I will just sort of point for your listeners to a couple places. We have on our website, what's called the DOT Navigator. Sounds wonky, but go take a look. It is a wealth of information about all our grant programs, and you can answer a series of questions, and it can help point you in the right direction. We also have a team of folks here who are dedicated to technical assistance and capacity building. So um, if you go to our website, you can find a lot of resources. And you know, I would recommend potentially for firms one nice thing we have is we have a division administration, Federal Highways Division Administration Office in all 50 states, in the state capitals. A great place, I think, to start for you know, local guidance. That's great. And the website is dot.gov? Yeah. Okay. If you, if you type in US DOT okay. Navigator. Or Department of Transportation, yeah, uh, DOT Navigator. A wealth okay. of things will pop up. And, and again, I don't always like to point people to a website, but I have to say we have devoted a lot of resources in making this website really robust and really user-friendly, not full of typical just federal jargon, which is, can be hard to follow. Well, you and Secretary Buttigieg, you're both very articulate, and you, you speak in English, not in policy <laughs> speak. <laughs> so I can imagine if you're checking it, you know, you're making sure that it's in English. Um, no, I appreciate that, because that's what people do. You know, they go to, re they go to the website to find it. Um, just very briefly, and it's a longer conversation, which we can't have now, but... Um, when I saw you at the at the DC Auto Show, one of the discussions that you had in collaboration with Deputy Secretary of Energy David Turk um, is about the grid. I mean, we're talking about electrifying so much more of the transportation system, and the grid has to be able to handle it. Yeah. 
So um, you and, and Gabe Klein was moderating it from the Office of Energy and Transportation. So if you can take a minute to just talk about how that coordination is happening, because people, you know, who are listening, they're going, well, yeah, well, you know, the electrons are, they're still coming from oil or whatever they want to say. But the grid has to be there. Absolutely. And it was built like 100 years ago. So how do we, and actually there's, everybody says the grid, but it's actually not one. It's, it's many. It's many. Yep. So can you just give like a little uh, sense of how you're tackling that? Absolutely. And I will just say, because you mentioned the, the Joint Office of, of Energy and Transportation, and I've, I've said this in other contexts, it's unprecedented, this effort. In the Obama administration, as I like to say, DOT, we worked a lot with HUD and EPA, as you would expect. We didn't do that much with the Department of Energy. Hmm. Um, in this administration, we are so firmly committed to decarbonizing the transportation sector. Department of Energy is probably our, our closest partner. I would bet. Yeah. Um, and the Joint Office, it's, I don't know that there's any, ever been anything quite like it in the federal government. It's been an extraordinary effort. And it's brought together two agencies with very different cultures and strengths and sort of areas of expertise. And it's been a wonderful synergy. Department of Energy, obviously, they are the masters of what is happening on the grid, on what is happening with how we decarbonize our energy supplies, on grappling with the permitting issues and all those sort of thorny things. And happy to say through the infrastructure, I have a lot of resources to tackle those challenges. And, you know, from, from Secretary Granholm and, and Deputy Secretary Turk on down, deep, deep expertise, people who've devoted their careers to thinking about how we're going to decarbonize the energy sector and do things like make sure we can power up, you know, an EV charging network. On the DOT side, we bring, I think, those close relationships with state DOTs, with transit agencies, with city DOTs, with sort of the folks on the ground that are the mm -hmm. operational practitioners of the transportation system who can tell you, here's where I need it, and this yeah. is what I need. I need um, a train know, station here. Right, I and I, a, I, you know, I'm not, I can't build a charging station over there. That's not going to work in New York City. But over here, we have an opportunity. Now, how do we bring together the energy provider, the regulators, and actually make this project a reality? Oh, that's cool. One of the fun things we did at the LA Mass Transit System was we had ART, Art for Rail Transit. And one of the ways that we got people in a community invested to use the system in their neighborhood was we had we commissioned local artists in that neighborhood to create the art for the station. Mm -hmm. And then we had local musicians from that neighborhood come and perform at the opening of the station. And so it was really cool and it got people excited for their neighborhood. What's your biggest challenge right now? I mean, I'll give this challenge. This is, uh, and again, I, I preface by saying Another reason I'm proud of my administration, we've passed some extraordinary pieces of bipartisan oh God, legislation. Yeah. I think we've been one of the most productive administrations in, in modern American history. But look, it's no secret, the political climate is challenging here in Washington. We are, I think, on our fourth continuing resolution of our annual appropriations bill. We are almost halfway through the fiscal year, and that brings a lot of budgetary uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I mentioned up top um, running the largest safety critical 24-7 operational system in the federal government. And we don't know what our full year budget is. Oh my God. I so I think just that level of uncertainty, I think, you know, something the public doesn't often see uh, is how challenging that can be. That we need, you know, sort of a, a a stable legislative and budgetary climate, I think, to, to do our work in its most optimal sense. Yeah, and the political dynamics are in the way of that for sure. I mean, if any, if a, if a CEO or a CFO did that in a company, they would have been out the door a long time ago because you, it's, it's, you know, there used to be a commercial that says, "Is this any way to run an airline?" I mean, <laughs> I mean, a, quite a, literally, you know, right? a commercial airline. By the way, as I did in New York City Transit, you have a ten-year capital budget, yeah, yeah, which we don't have at the federal level. Wow. So it's a very, that, that oh I think God. is probably yeah. our biggest challenge. I would imagine um, it is. But again, I, you know, that said, we've gotten some astonishing, I think, amazing generational transportation legislation, uh, you know, in our time in Washington. So 
challenges, but extraordinary well, opportunities. Well, you have, too. yes. And in fairness, that money came from the last Congress, not from this one. And under a but Speaker it was Pelosi. A, but, it was, but it was it bipartisan. Was, it was bipartisan. Yeah, the, the, big, the infrastructure bill yeah, is bipartisan. Our big piece of legislation yeah. had been bipartisan. And, yeah. and I know the president on down, we're proud of that. Absolutely. I mean, Mitch McConnell even showed up with uh, President Biden at the, uh, the opening of repairs for the, his favorite bridge between Kentucky and Ohio. The Brent Spence Bridge. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So um, I want to talk about careers for a second. And one of the things that I've talked to people about is, and I kind of touched on this with the business opportunities, but all of this, this transportation revolution, this infrastructure revolution and, and massive upgrade at once, it's like the, you know, the federal highway bill on steroids, also creates whole new career paths. I mean, it's creating new jobs. I mean, not, not just new new individual jobs, but a whole new type of job. Like the, the um, head of manufacturing, basically, she's changed titles since I talked to her, but of GM, told me that they may be not needing as many people on the assembly plants now, but now they need data analysts mm -hmm. and they need different types of, of skills altogether that they never needed before. And of course, when I worked in EVs, you know, that was, that was obvious. So talk about the new types of career paths and types of jobs um, and opportunities that you're seeing from your chair. Well, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you a, an interesting answer on the sort of public sector transportation agency side because I know you think a lot about women in the yeah. in the workforce. So it's interesting. I'll use New York City DOT as a good example. For generations, New York City DOT was run by an engineer. They were all men. And then at a certain point, actually with Iris Weinshaw, Chuck Schumer's wife, she became the first woman to run New York City. She wasn't an engineer. She was followed by Jeanette Sadekan, also not an engineer. Then followed by me, also not an engineer. Because I think over time there was a realization, transportation is not just the domain of engineers. You need planners, you need political skills, you need communication skills, you know, that it is a much more interdisciplinary field than it had sort of previously been imagined. And I think that opened the door, particularly for women, um, people of color as well, uh, you know, who have not traditionally been encouraged to go into the engineering field. I think you're seeing that in transportation writ large. It is becoming, as you point out, not just manufacturing. You need technical skills, data skills, communication skills, all kinds of things that were not in the traditional domain of transportation, but are now absolutely essential. So. You know, I always like to make the pitch. It's an incredible field. Once people get into it, they make it a they make it a lifelong passion. Um, here at USDOT, we are hiring up, and we're always looking for people who want to join us. We're doing some great things. So um, I like to close um, every interview bouncing off of that with career advice, especially for mid-career women. So if you could think about women who have at least ten, maybe fifteen years of experience, even who know what they're good at, have an education, um, and they want to use their experience and their education to make a difference. They're ambitious, they want to make money in advance in their careers, and they also want to make a difference. So what advice would you give to them? It's funny, you, you said these women know what they're good at, but you know what, women don't always know what they're good at. Um, you know, I think that they're not actually always encouraged to sort of realize their own value and you know all the talents they have. It, it's a little bit of a joke, but it has actually been a surprising truism throughout my career that a job will open up and it'll they'll list ten qualifications. I'll see a woman; she has nine of the ten, and she says, oh, "I'm I'm not qualified for it." A man with far fewer of those ten qualifications is quite confident he, he's best for the job. That is, a, I think, a socialization thing that I still see. So I think my advice to the mid-career women, and by the way wasn't advice I always took. Um, I think I left some opportunities and dollars on the table. So I, I give this advice, you know, from personal experience. Um, you know, you know more than you think. You have incredible value. Seek out those opportunities. Take some risks. I mean, these are cliches in a way, but I think worth repeating. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, one of the things that I noticed is that even for myself as well is we think that the things we do well, everybody can do because we can do them well. And so we extrapolate that that's not special because if we can do it and we can do it easily, we don't think it's special. It's kind of an interesting thing. 
Well, this has been amazing. I could talk to you for about eight hours, but um, any final thoughts before I let you get back to your day job? I mean, just some appreciation for you. Thanks for highlighting these issues. And, you know, it is great to see women in this space, you know, transportation. Uh, you know, look, we are still evolving as a field that is welcoming for women. Um, and so it is great to have this dialogue with you. Thanks. Maybe we'll get to do it again sometime. Yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you so much for joining me today. Deputy Secretary of Transportation, Polly Trottenberg. Thank you. I also want to just say thank you for what you do every day for the country and for advocating for women and helping to reduce the carbon footprint. So I just I want to acknowledge thank you. the decisions that you have to make every day that I'm sure are tough. So what do you want to get? Uh, how do you want to get from place to place? What did Secretary Trottenberg say today that resonated with you? What questions do you have for her? Post it to us on Twitter or Threads or LinkedIn at Joan Michelson. Send us any questions there that you may have. You may win a complimentary 30-minute coaching session with me. And please subscribe to our mailing list to stay abreast of our unbelievable guests like Secretary Trottenberg, our articles, and career advice. And you can do that on electricladiespodcast.com. I'm Joan Michelson. Thank you for joining us today. See you next time.